In this week's drive, we wonder who will watch Weber with Williams. Wonder why Dakar racers stay so close in the Sahara. Revel in the revival of a really famous name. And see how the spirit of Senna survives in Sao Paulo. All this and more in this week's Drive. The historic railway station in Barcelona was an unusual setting for one of the first Formula One launches of the year. Japanese car giant Toyota enters its fourth season in Formula One with an all-new driver lineup and what they hope will be a seriously competitive car. The brand new TF105 was unveiled by former Williams driver Ralf Schumacher and Jarno Trulli, who joined Toyota for the last two races of last season. Olivia Panis is demoted to test driver alongside Ricardo Zonta. What does Ralph hope to achieve? I've certainly been more successful in, in 04 with the team, having more points. And hopefully if everything runs perfect uh, from mid-season to go from for one or the other podium, that'd be a, a perfect work. His teammate Trulli enjoyed his best season in 04, winning in Monaco for Renault and finishing in the points nine times. I'm joining Toyota basically because for me it's a new challenge and uh, I believe uh, in this team, which is putting a lot of effort in Formula One. They need a good driver, they need to develop, and they need to get on the top. And uh, actually, as a second uh, uh, world car constructor, uh, they are putting a lot of effort and they believe in what they're doing. So I think uh, that together we can do an extremely good job. So for me, again, it's a good, big challenge. For all their investment in Formula One, some estimates put it at $400 million annually, Toyota have had a poor return. In none of their 51 Grand Prix to date have they made the top three, and they've earned just 27 points in three years. However, the top brass at Toyota will take a dim view of the team if they don't make the podium in 2005. It's been all change at Ralph's old team too. BMW Williams lost both Schumacher and Juan Pablo Montoya, but replaced them with Australian Mark Webber and well, no one's really sure yet. In team testing at the new track in Bahrain, the squad revealed two possible teammates. German Nick Heidfeld and Weber's former teammate at Jaguar, Antonio Pizzonia of Brazil, who was Williams' test driver last year, are in competition for the much-coveted second seat. Weber, who made his debut with Minardi in 2002 and then spent two years at Jaguar, is so far the only confirmed driver at BMW-powered Williams. The team finished last season in fourth place overall. The Australian's stirring fifth place for Minardi in Melbourne on his debut in 2002 remains his best finish in Formula One, but that is sure to change now that he's joined a winning team. Mark was clearly glad to have made the move and was satisfied with his new team and the car. Yeah, very good. I think uh, I was waiting for the new year to come, come quite quickly, to be honest. I've done some testing in uh, November, December, but that was uh, not really that official. Now it is it's fully official and uh, we can work with the sponsors and uh, it's, it's much, much better. So uh, BMW Williams is a, is a great team. I'm looking forward to working with them. Weber has wasted no time in impressing his new employers. Team boss Sir Frank Williams hailed his new driver as inspirational and looked forward to him showing what he could do behind the wheel when the new season starts in Melbourne on March the 6th. For his part, Weber knows what he needs to do. Well, winning as much as possible. Uh, we need to be able to do that, but uh, like I said, it's going to be very, very tough. There's a lot of other teams that have the same goals, and uh, it's, it's going to be a tough, tough fight, but uh, that's the goals. That's why we all the work at the factories at both BMW and at Williams, uh, they're all pushing to, to strive for victories. So Frank still has a few weeks before he must decide on who will partner Weber next season. Although Petsonia knows the car, Heidfeld proved quicker in early tests. We need to give both these drivers, who are the aspirants for the drive, every opportunity to demonstrate that they are better than the other. And we don't want whoever loses by the end of the month, the unlucky candidate, to feel he was un unfairly treated. So we've got three long test sessions in January, and then we will uh, decide at that time. Nick Heidfeld, who raced for the Ferrari-powered Sauber squad in the past and the off-form Jordan team last year, has been testing with Williams since November. Following his efforts last year, BMW engine chief Dr. Mario Thiessen hinted that Heidfeld would probably get a testing role if Petonia was chosen to partner Weber ahead of him. 
But for the German, the chance of joining one of only three teams to have won the World Championship in the last 15 years has only recently sunk in. That's pretty special. I already had two tests with them, which were really great. But now to, to see the helmet actually for the first time with all the sponsors on it and, and the new livery of the overall, and I really feel very much part of the team now. It's great. Williams presented its new look when it displayed its all-new livery on last year's cars at a special team launch at the state-of-the-art circuit in Bahrain. In addition to media and a long list of guests, many race fans from the Middle East watched the day's events from the circuit's main grandstand. They were treated to a spectacular BMW Speed Challenge with an FW26, a Formula BMW car and a BMW M5 competing against each other. Petonia also has a game plan to secure a seat in the team. Concentrate, do my best, uh, do my homework. Uh, obviously, uh, we're going to have a few uh, very important uh, tests in, uh, in January, and uh, I'll be working very hard to, to get the, the drive for next year, for this year. Antonio was fired midway through his season with Jaguar after a string of underperformances, but stepped up from test driver at Williams to fill in for the injured Ralph Schumacher in four races last year and produced some decent finishes. Sir Frank has said signing Mark Webber was astonishingly good value for money. According to Williams, Webber is worth working hard for because he's very much liked by all the Williams staff and because he's totally committed to Formula One. He goes into the factory frequently and makes himself available and talks to people. William said that the 28-year-old Australian takes his job very seriously. The last Australian world champion was Alan Jones, who won in 1980 with Williams. And although the decision of the second driver is expected soon, the choice could stretch out until the first race in Australia. Well, we're obliged to make that decision by March the 3rd, three days before the Australian Grand Prix. But uh, uh, the intention is to achieve a decision before the launch of the FW27 on January the 31st. Uh, but it's a very important decision. Uh, I would expect there will be enough running and enough uh, competitive running between the two drivers to make a decision by that time. Weber's teammate was supposed to be Jensen Button, but his cast iron contract at BAR meant that he was embarrassingly forced to retract his announced move to Williams late last year. A record number of competitors began the 2005 Dakar Rally in Barcelona. A total of 696 cars, motorbikes and trucks started the 9,000-kilometer race across five countries, which ended in the Senegalese capital. Belgian Stefan Peterhansel began the rally as favorite to defend his title in the four-wheeled category. The six-time Dakar motorcycle champion's 2004 victory for Mitsubishi saw him become only the second man in history to complete the double. Day two of the rally saw competitors head south on a long 920-kilometer journey to Granada on an untimed liaison stage. Competitive action would resume with a 10-kilometer stage in Granada, with motorcycle competitors starting in reverse order from their results in Barcelona, and cars and trucks starting in order of their classification on the prologue. Thus, Yamaha rider David Frattin would set off last. KTM rider Denis Comte had to withdraw from the event almost before it had begun, after the Frenchman had all his official documents, money and credit cards stolen from his service van. After the long road journey from Barcelona, it was back to business for competitors on a short 10-kilometer stage near Granada. Former World Rally champion Colin McRae won the section in his Nissan to claim the overall lead from stage one winner Robbie Gordon. Petter Hansel in his Mitsubishi finished second fastest, just six seconds behind the Scotsman. Another former World Rally champion, Ari Vatanen of Finland, was a further four seconds adrift of the lead in his Nissan. A 
American overnight leader Robbie Gordon came fifth, 15 seconds behind McRae in his Volkswagen Touareg. In the bikes, Fratine took his Yamaha to another win, beating the KTM of South African Alfie Cox, who had crashed on the beach in the prologue, injuring his shoulder. In the truck category, Dutchman Hans Bex and his DAF crew held on to the lead. After the stage, competitors travelled to Rabat in Morocco by ferry, ready to race the next morning. But the fourth stage got off to an inauspicious start when heavy fog forced the cancellation of the motorcycle stage meaning safety helicopters couldn't take off. The field travelled to the end of the stage in formation, keeping David Fratine in the lead two seconds ahead of Cox. There was no such trouble for the cars, though, with the Volkswagen of NASCAR driver Robbie Gordon dominating the day. Gordon won the opening stage of the rally and the first African stage of the competition, a 123-kilometre special stage between Rabat and Agadir in Morocco, presenting few problems. The American clocked the best time of the day, 53 seconds quicker than the defending champion Peter Hansel, although he did receive a little help from the locals at one point. Peter Hansel, who finished second in the third stage behind former World Rally champion Colin McRae, remains in touch though, just 59 seconds behind Gordon in the overall classification. Frenchman Bruno Sabi drove his Volkswagen into third place on the stage and third overall in a time of one hour, 15 minutes and nine seconds, 68 seconds off the quickest time of the day. Overnight leader McRae slipped back to 10th place overall, but fellow rally veteran Juha Kunkunen moved up to seventh overall, three and a half minutes behind Gordon. Gregoire de Mavius, who moved from BMW to Nissan this year, finished seventh on the stage and eighth overall. Following the cancelled motorcycle stage, the bike racers were keen to get to grips with the fifth stage, at 381 kilometres, the longest so far, with a border crossing between Morocco and Western Sahara. Spain's Mark Coma, riding a KTM, was looking for his first stage win of this year's competition, but he was upstaged at the last moment by teammate Andy Caldicott, who clocked four hours and nine seconds to Pip Coma by just three seconds and register Australia's first ever stage win. It was an impressive performance from Caldicott, who was forced out of last year's event through injury, but Coma took the overall lead with a time of four hours, 13 minutes and 13 seconds. Colin McRae recovered from a puncture in the fourth stage to dominate on four wheels and win by six minutes and 15 seconds over his nearest rival to claim the overall lead. Japan's Hiroshi Masuoka had a terrible day. The double winner of the Dakar suffered a series of problems, not the least of which was this puncture, and limped home in 124th place over three hours behind McRae. Another former winner was also dropping down the field. Stefan Pederhansel, the reigning champion on four wheels, finished 15th over 23 minutes off the pace, and as a result, he dropped to 14th in the overall standings. It wasn't all doom and gloom for some of the Dakar's big names, though. Germany's Jutta Kleinschmidt hauled her Volkswagen into third place on the day, good enough to move the 2001 champion up to fourth place overall, just three seconds behind the former skiing legend Luc Alphane of France. Italian Fabrizio Mione started the sixth day in sixth place overall, but climbed three places thanks to a welcome stage victory ahead of his KTM teammate, Paul Anders Ullevasetta. The Norwegian had a little tumble in the soft desert sand, but was up again quickly to finish just a minute and 30 seconds behind Mione, and his good finish helped him climb up to seventh overall, 12 minutes and 37 seconds behind France's Cyril Dupre. The Frenchman finished fourth behind Mione, Ullevasetta and South African Alfie Cox, but did enough to claim the overall lead from Spaniard Mark Coma. Dupre leads the Dakar in his KTM, just 35 seconds ahead of Coma, who finished fifth on the stage. He only lies third overall, a further minute and 16 seconds back. There was drama when two potential winners crashed out on the same day. 
Robbie Gordon's Dakar debut took a turn for the worse when he rolled his Volkswagen just after checkpoint one. The American NASCAR driver, more used to turning left on banked ovals, lost valuable time with front brake and gearbox troubles. It was also a day to forget for Colin McRae, who was leading the rally going into the sixth stage, but crashed out near the end. McRae and his co-driver Tina Torner, partner of DTM champion Matthias Ekstrom, were said to be fine after a checkup. Lots of places like this, it's you know full speed, and you have to be very careful with the bumps. It didn't, it didn't look so bad, but the sand was very soft at the bottom, and the, the car dug in the sand and then flipped over. Defending champion Peter Hansel moved into the overall lead with victories on both stages six and seven. The Mitsubishi driver beat Nasa Alatia's BMW by over 25 minutes on the 660 kilometer and longest section of the event between Zurat and Tishit. He claimed top spot from overnight leader Bruno Sabi after his Volkswagen Touareg was damaged and he lost nearly half an hour. Jutta Kleinschmidt clocked the third fastest time to move up to third overall, with Luke Alphand finishing fourth after losing four minutes stuck in camel grass and ending the day second overall. Many cars suffered problems on the demanding 660-kilometer stretch of desert. Jean-Louis Schlesser lost a vital amount of time as he waited for assistance to fix the left rear wheel of his Ford, while 1997 Dakar winner Kenjiro Shinozuka retired from the rally having rolled his Nissan. A sandstorm of varying intensity made conditions difficult with details difficult to determine, making high speed and navigations especially difficult in the treacherous conditions. Frenchman David Frattin won the bike stage on his Yamaha as Mark Comer regained the overall lead, despite finishing 4 minutes and 31 seconds adrift. Overnight leader Cyril Dupre finished third fastest, with Alfie Cox finishing fourth to share third place overall with Australia's Andy Caldicott. The competitors were facing a 538-kilometre stage across the desert the next day. But the eighth stage, which was expected to be the toughest route of the event, was cancelled as sandstorms made racing in the Mauritanian desert too hazardous. We'll bring you the rest of the Dakar rally in next week's Drive. This is the motor show in Bologna. Bologna is the home of Italian motorcycling, and not only of Ducati, the most famous modern brand that's uh, produced here, but the newest one on the block, Moto Marini. That's the Corsaro 1200 that I had a hand in presenting here to the public of the world at, uh, at motor show. What do I think of the Corsaro 1200? Well, I had the chance to ride it in prototype form uh, a couple of days ago. And I hate to say it, but this is the, the anti-monster par excellence. It's going to be head-to-head -head with Ducati's uh, S4R. It's probably the bike that Ducati ought to have built five years ago, but didn't. They've managed to make a Euro 3 friendly, so 2007 homologation uh, and emissions levels uh, friendly model which has fantastic performance, 140 horsepower, loads of torque, revs out to 9,500 RPM, accelerates like a naked dragster, and is great fun to ride. It handles, steers, stops, does everything right. The only thing I don't like about it is the exhaust. I think the rest of it's pretty neat. The styling is done by Luciano Marabesi, who's a pretty famous Italian designer. He's done lots of motor goodsies. He did the, uh, the Griso. Uh, he did the, uh, the Centauro, he did the new Breva, he's done lots of scooters for Piaggio. He's one of the top designers in Italy, just not a man who puts himself about or comes to the forefront very much. He lets his products do the talking for him. And I think that this Corsaro 1200 says it all. It's a great looking bike and it delivers. Interestingly, the crank case is made out of a single piece, so you don't split the cases to work on the bike. So not horizontally or, or uh, vertically split. This means it's very strong, quite light. It's a new generation V-twin engine. Not 90 degree, I almost said that. It's 87 degrees. Why? Losing those extra three degrees gains you an inch in, in length or saves you an inch in length in the engine. Makes everything more compact as well as more robust. 
It's been a very cleverly designed, a well thought out product, and it'll be in your shop soon. That's the thing I can't get over. These guys have developed a brand new engine and a completely new bike in just two years. This doesn't happen nowadays, especially with homologation and everything. So take a new four-stroke engine and produce it from a clean sheet of paper to being in the shops in two and a half years is pretty smart. The guys that own the company, the Berti family, used to have Italy's biggest TV and video machine uh, manufacturing operation. They know what people want, and they know that the customer isn't prepared to put up with uh, bad after-sales service or a lack of spare parts. That's why I think that this is a really important introduction for a new make as well as a new model. I think it'll be a success. An interactive show called The Senna Experience has so far attracted more than 60,000 Brazilians to the city of Sao Paulo to see the definitive exhibition about the life and legacy of the country's most famous Formula One driver, Ayrton Senna. One of the exhibits, the kart used by Senna in an exhibition race in France in 1993. A movie shows 11 cars driven by Senna in several categories. The knowledge room is where visitors learn how a combustion engine, a cockpit and a Formula One gearbox works. Three work tables used by Formula One architects serve as multimedia terminals where the audience can discover details of each item. The pit stop room allows visitors to join a Formula One team where they simulate a pit stop by changing the tires and refueling in the shortest time. One of Ayrton's racing suits. Just some of the helmets used by the driver during his career. He has an experience that everyone wants. This giant helmet attached to pantographic arms allows an audio-visual experience of a ride round the Interlagos circuit with Senna himself narrating the action. Ayrton Senna was a big Formula One driver on the track. Here's the Lotus that Senna drove in 1987 at the beginning of his career. In the McLaren room is the car that Ayrton drove in 1990, which took him to the top of the world for the second time. The victory room contains 17 of the trophies that Senna won during his career. Here is his first Formula One trophy, which he won in Estoril in Portugal, driving a Lotus, finishing ahead of Alain Prost, his fiercest rival. His last trophy is also here, won at home at the 1994 Brazilian Grand Prix in a Williams, just weeks before his death at Imola. 71-year-old Maria Inez de Cavallo took her husband and nine-year-old granddaughter to the exhibition. He transmitted such a range of good values to the entire world, not only to Brazil, so the whole world admires him. A picture wall displays vivid memories of Senna on the podium. Senna the schoolboy in 1965. This one shows the driver playing football, his other great passion. Here, visitors experience the cockpit of a Formula One car at the Interlagos circuit. In a 180-degree cinema, the audience sits inside the simulator, giving them the sensation of speeding around a racetrack. According to Ayrton's 25-year-old niece, Bianca, the reaction of visitors to the exhibition is always emotional. For the family, it's awesome to see how people is reacting to bring up again Ayrton as he was alive, you know, so it's really good. It's expected the Senna experience will visit other cities around the world. So whether you're taking sensible precautions, racing across the desert, or making a stylish return, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.